It seems that all of the major musical events of Paris 1913 took place in one plush theatre, the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées. Its owner, Gabriel Astruc, opened his proto-art deco doors in April and shut them, bankrupt, in October. It was on his stage that one notable night in May, the Parisian elite watched for the first time a poor young woman surrounded by a pagan mob whose actions ended in ritual slaughter to placate the supreme god. Very well received on the 10th of May was Gabriel Faure's opera Pinilope, Penelope, his setting of the revengeful end to Homer's Odyssey. But only five nights later, in the same theatre, all thought of Penelope vanished when Debussy's music for Je was first performed there. This new ballet was choreographed and danced by the adored Nijinsky. He was teamed with Tamara Kasavina and Ludmila Scholler as his female tennis partners, whose Je, games, mixed rackets with erotics. Although Debussy grumbled about the overly stylized, ill-omened feet of Nijinsky's choreography, the work proved a sufficiently shocking sensation for the Ballet Russe's first, and last, season at the new venue. Debussy has succeeded in his aim to make the sensual orchestra sound as if lit from behind, as he put it. He also made the ballet, built out of many sections and shifts, flow through what he called colours of rhythmicized time. It remains a score to wonder at. But barely two weeks later, all thought of Je was eclipsed when another poor young woman was surrounded by a pagan mob whose action ended in ritual sacrifice to placate the supreme god. For it was in Astruc's new theatre on the 29th of May that the notorious riot of the Rite of Spring took place. Was it really a riot? By all accounts, it was riotish. The police were called and some of the more heated protesters were removed. Astruc stood on stage between the two parts of the ballet and begged for calm, which he didn't get, until finally the sacrificed girl, danced by Maria Piltz, took command of the theatre in her closing solo. For the main part, disorder, shrill arguments and raucous insults were reported in all of the written accounts, including those penned by the likes of Gertrude Stein, who weren't even there. They wanted to be there, that's the point. What was the riot about? Was the audience dismayed at being shown pictures of pagan Russia, as the ballet subtitle had it? Hardly. One of the ballet Russi's reliable showstoppers was the macho staging of Borodin's Palopsian dances. And by now the Parisian public was accustomed to the company's integration of the theatrical effect, of the dance, the decor and the music worked up together. In the end, the uproar on the 29th of May didn't seem to be directed at the idiomatic choreography of Nijinsky or the psychedelic makeup and folk designs of Nicholas Röhrig or Stravinsky's audacious score. It may be argued that the source and subject of the revolt was not the artists, but Astruc. Astruc was the highly successful agent of the dancer Matahari. He invented the Paris spring season for modish foreign art to visit the capital. When the Slavic impresario Serge Diaghilev started his Russian seasons at the Paris Opera in 1907, it was Astruc who managed the French end of business. He acted as Diaghilev's associate in 1909 when the Russian ballet, Les Ballets Russes, was formed at the Châtelet Theatre. By 1913, Astruc had sensed that there was a fresh market for the exotic, the opulent, the novel and the modernistic. His refined audience had developed its own channels of circulation to promote their voguish interests, such as the salons and the soirees in their own homes. Astruc believed that the imperial theatres of the opera and the Châtelet failed to offer the most seductive structure and ambience for this beau monde denomination. His new audiences comprised subsidized bohemians, intellectuals, the new industrialists, their investors, and, highly important in this scene, their wives. Among them were Countess Severine Philippine de Castel-Gluckberg, otherwise known as Daisy Fellows, Maria Godebska, also known as Mizia Natanson, Edwards or Sert, depending on the date, and the Princess de Saint Montbéliard, also known as Princess Edmond de Polignac, also known as Winneretta Singer, the sewing machine heiress. They were patrons of what Debussy acidly termed the success market. 
For these, their affluent husbands, in stiff hats, and those they patronised, in soft hats, Astruc had his own theatre built. The thing was, Astruc was Jewish. The Dreyfus affair still poisoned the air. Astruc was refused permission to build on the Champs-Élysées itself, where his theatre would be the one closest to the homes of the art-loving tycoons of the 8th and 16th arrondissement. Instead, he built his elegant venue further down near the river. Due to its weight on silty ground, a new construction material was given its first public use in Paris. Many books have been written about the result, and my favourite reveals the innovation in its very title, Théâtre de Champs-Élysées, The Magic of Reinforced Concrete. Astruc's auditorium held nearly 2,000 seats, and it was designed in such a way that the curved dress circle, the large boxes and the linking promenade were close enough for conversation to mesh. What was uttered by the stiff hats in the boxes could be heard by the soft hats in the seats. So, on the evening of the 29th of May, it needed only a murmur of incredulity at any aspect of the rite of spring to ignite a blaze of indignation. When the Countess de Portal, her tiara askew, shouted that, for the first time in sixty years, someone has dared to make fun of me, her comment was so widely reported that we can be sure it wasn't. Yet her remark exposes the social rather than the artistic dimension of this riot. Jean Cocteau claimed that the audience played the part allotted to it by generating editorial hype for the premiere. Astruc had first opened his venue on the 2nd of April with a triumphant gala concert. Five French composers conducted their own works. The veteran Saint-Saëns was followed by Debussy, Dandy, Faure and Ducat, who directed his sorcerer's apprentice. Through this classy event, Astruc was uniting for one evening the rival musical factions of the capital. Saint-Saëns loathed Dandy, while Debussy once said, I have a horror of sentimentality, and I cannot forget that its name is Saint-Saëns. The all-embracing concert neglected only the latest French trends, the evocations of Ravel, the satires of Satie, and the social realism of Charpentier. Ravel was able to rest on his laurels. He gained immense success in the previous season through his symphonic score to the ballet russes Daphnis and Chloe. Although his former teacher, Faure, complained about this newfangled music with its lavish profusion and big effects, Ravel's sophisticated instrumentation would influence generations to come, from Berg to Berio and Benjamin, which is not very far alphabetically, but it is so otherwise. Yet Ravel did contribute to Asterix's new theatre. He worked with Stravinsky on a realisation of Kovanshina, an opera that Mazorsky had left unfinished thirty years earlier. The premiere of the Stravinsky-Ravel version was given the week after that of the Rite of Spring. But the star bass, Feodor Shalyapin, insisted on singing with a more conventional orchestration, and so a version was cobbled together which flopped. As for Eric Satie, he could never be accused of lavish profusion. It was said that Satie's job was to decongest music. A story went around at this time that someone had offered Stravinsky a commission, which he'd turned down because the fee was too low. The work was then offered to Satie, who declined it because the fee was too high. Earning his keep as a cabaret pianist, Satie wrote in June seven little dances for a stuffed monkey which he inserted into a surreal play he'd just written called The Trap of Medusa. It was for this play that Satie could be said to have invented the prepared piano by placing sheets of paper between the strings to give it a spikier sound. Meanwhile, the least chic, though most popular of Parisian composers, was crusading socially and musically, like Astruc, but in the opposite direction. Gustave Charpentier sought to bring art to the disenfranchised, his opera Louise was the most successful French stage work of the Belle Epoque. In it, the city of Paris itself epitomized the prospect of freedom from emptiness and pauperism. At the opera's opening run at the head of the century, Charpentier had given blocks of seats away in the opera comique to young dressmakers. The socialist composer went on to open the Conservatoire Populaire Mimi Pinson. He named it after the heroine of Mousset's story about a penniless working girl. 
Offering free music tuition to seamstresses and the like, Charpentier's conservatoire ran until the start of the Second World War. But it was in 1913 that Charpentier completed a partnering opera to Louise, that of Julien, the story of her lover. In this archetype of magic realism, the entertainment district of Pigalle symbolized all that was magical about Paris, apart, of course, from its reinforced concrete. The premiere of Julien took place in Paris one week after that of the Rite of Spring, and so we shouldn't be surprised that it got lost to fortune. So much did in the wake of the Rite. It's been said many times that since Stravinsky's intimidating score was first played, all composers have wanted to create their right. Regrettably, there have been more wrongs than rights. Yet even at the time, the right's significance was justly recognized. The critic Roland Manuel argued that Stravinsky has deliberately changed the color of his music and all music. Another exclaimed that Stravinsky's work marks an epoch not only in the history of music and dance, but in that of all the arts. The history of dance? Frankly, the Rite of Spring has never made for a great ballet. Its seismic ferocity and harmonic insolence have always overwhelmed the stage behind it. Jean Cocteau believed that the cause of the stiff hat's derision on the Rite's first night was the ballet's monotony of automata. The climax, he wrote, was like a factory blowing up. That's a potent phrase in a period of conspicuous rearmament. But it would take a year for Stravinsky's score to triumph, and that was in a concert performance in Paris, after which Stravinsky was carried shoulder-high around the Place de la Trinité. His best ballet came next in The Wedding, Les Noces, and that took a decade to realise. Stravinsky spent so long on it because he was looking for a more objective sound world. He found it first in automata, in player pianos and percussion. After all, 1913 was the year that Luigi Russolo wrote his futurist manifesto, The Art of Noise. Stravinsky was interested enough to visit a show of Russolo's noise machines. The exhilarating world of the motorized and the automated had become the passion of Parisian investors. Even Astruc's programme books contained ads for the latest cars by Peugeot and Rolls-Royce. No wonder that one critic on the Wright's first night hit on the ultimate insult by claiming that Stravinsky's music sounded like the creaking of a hundred unoiled cartwheels. The most interesting review that evening came from Jacques Riviere, the future editor of the Nouvelle Revue Française. He used the Wright to attack Debussy. Riviere believed Debussy to be the morbid manipulator of blurs and veils. In contrast, Stravinsky's right was whole and tough, he wrote, his parts raw, everything crisp, intact and clear. Instead of evoking it, he utters it. This portrayal suggests to me Stravinsky in his post-war objective phase. So for Riviere to hear the right as the launch of that, rather than the climax of his Russian period, is quite remarkable. The ballet was given six times in Astruc's theatre and then six times in London. There were no more riots. Astruc carried on with his impressive programme, but he stretched the season beyond the appeal and purse of his patrons. In October, out of desperation, he revived Foray's opera. Foray wrote to his wife that Astruc will bring the price of seats back down to the normal level and will then bring Pinilop into contact with the real public but after seven performances, the theatre went bust. Astruc earned enough from Matahari to survive until she was arrested as a German spy and executed by firing squad. His experiment in mingling two publics had failed. Yet Astruc identified an appetite for the avant-garde, which would ensure that Paris, once the Great War was over, would call nearly all the neoclassic tunes. <laughs> 